Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming this morning. I'm going to be presenting work carried out over the past couple of years, both as part of my PhD and with the help of master's student Kieran Goss, who's here. And we looked at exceptional preservation of soft tissue in Jurassic ichthyosaurs. So a little bit of a history of what's known of soft tissues in, in uh, ichthyosaurs. Not long after the initial discovery of these iconic marine reptiles, soft tissues started coming to light. Uh, this was from both specimens from the Lyme Regis area where Mary Anning and co were collecting in the early 1800s. But many of the most exceptional specimens were coming from near Holzmaden in Germany. And these included several with these complete body outlines preserved in soft tissues. And this helped to reveal features like the presence of dorsal fin and the tail flukes that would otherwise not be known if just the skeletons were preserved. However, it does need to be pointed out that with some of the Holtzmatter material, particularly the older stuff, there has been somewhat of a history of, uh, shall we say, embellishment of soft tissues and things have been enhanced and added, so you need to be careful when looking at some of these specimens. It was also noted early on that microstructural features were sometimes preserved within the soft tissues, and probably the most famous of these are fibres, um, which were found on numerous specimens, including those from the UK, such as this skull from Gloucestershire here, and also many of the Holtzmann specimens. Now these were mentioned in various papers over the past 100 years or so, but it was only in recent history that they've been described in any detail. So around 20 years ago, a paper came out that described many of the specimens from Holtzmann, and in that, it was suggested that there were a variety of fibre types that showed a varied morphology and size range. However, last year we published a paper in paleontology which called a number of these interpretations into question based on the fact that there had been misidentification of features such as preparation scratches and cracks within the matrix of the fossil. Therefore, we decided that the situation needed a bit of clarity, so we thought we would look at ichthyosaur soft tissue in more detail. We also wanted to look at things like the preservation of organics in the fossils um, with an eye towards paleo colour, so looking at the colour of the animals, and to generally look at the taphonomy of the different soft tissues. So to do this, we looked at a number of exceptional specimens from UK localities. Um, importantly, uh, these specimens don't have any of the potential issues with soft tissue enhancement that you get with the old Holtzmann material, and many of them are only half prepared out of the rock, so soft tissues could be freshly uh, exposed and sampled. The specimens come from the Toarshan Strawberry Bank Formation collected near Ilminster in the mid-1800s, a specimen from the Kimmeridgian in the Etches collection, and a newly discovered and excavated specimen from the Blue Lias of Lyme Regis. All of the fossils have extensive soft tissue preservation throughout, but they have differing deg degrees of preservation, which seems to depend on the location. This uh, specimen, for example, is the Lyme Regis one, which is probably the best preserved of the bunch. And we have a range of soft tissues preserved, so you have dark organics here, and then you have phosphatized material, which often shows impressions of these fibrous-like structures. So the fibers were common to all of the specimens we looked at, and here are some examples from one strawberry bank specimen and the Lyme Regis specimen. And we, we've got light images and SEM images here, and the first thing to note is that under the SEM, there are no actual fibers preserved we have instead impressions of the fibres retained in a phosphatic matrix. So it seems, therefore, that rather than the fibres mineralising themselves, we had phosphatization occurring around the fibres, which then were lost, whether during decay or diagenesis, uh, leaving ghosts or impressions of the fibres. You'll also note that many of the fibres are just a single layer of parallel running fibres, and these were common to all specimens and tended to run parallel to the longitudinal axis of the body. Uh, we also have other layers with fibres that run at different orientations to this, but these cross-orientating fibres were consistently smaller than the main layer by as much as two to three times in some cases. We also had an additional phosphatized tissue in some of the specimens that lay underneath these fibres, but it had a more amorphous texture. So based on this evidence, we've interpreted that as probably representing a hypodermis or superficial fascia, and that would make the fibres dermal in origin, which is what they were originally described as in the first place. So from that, we have created a schematic of how we think these fibres would have looked in life in the ichthyosaur. So we have these fibres running longitudinally along the body, and they are uh, overlain or underlain by cross-orientating fibres of smaller dimension. 
We couldn't sample the chimerid specimen for Essing images, but it does have, again, these fibers running parallel to the body long axis. But in this specimen, however, there seems to have been a certain degree of post-mortem decay, because the fibers here appear to have begun to pull apart ever so slightly prior to fossilization. So we also looked at uh, one of the most exceptional Holtzmann specimens, again, to try and clarify the situation a little. Um, and as you can see, straight away, the soft tissue looks quite different to the UK material. For example, we have these long, phosphatized, linear features, and these were originally described as a different class of much larger collagen fiber. However, we've reinterpreted these based on the new images we have as being more likely to represent uh, folds or wrinkles in the skin that have had the surfaces ground down, giving the appearance of the fibers. Um, you can see the entire integument of this animal is, is quite deformed and has folds and wrinkles throughout. We did identify what we consider to be uh, genuine fibrous material from the dermis in these specimens, which you can see here, and it has a very similar morphology to all of the UK material. But in this case, it tends to be preserved in these small discrete patches rather than any kind of expansive sheets. As I mentioned, we also looked at the preservation of organics in these fossils. Uh, we performed TOFSIMs on a number of the samples and found key organics known to be associated with melanin in living animals. And when we popped those samples under the SEM, we found abundant melanosomes preserved. These melanosomes, importantly, were the same morphology of the melanosomes that you get in the integument of living reptiles today. What was really interesting is that we found different, uh, different layers of organics, which we think represent different original tissues in the animal. So we have this layer, which sat above the fibers, which is a phosphatized layer, with these little black spots in. And when we pop that under the SEM, we find that the spots are actually made of these clusters of melanosomes that have a kind of dendritic morphology. And these are very rep reminiscent of melanocytes that you get in the ep uh, epidermis of living reptiles. So I was pretty excited about this, and this was a pretty novel discovery until I'm sure some of you have read a paper came out last week in Science describing exactly the same thing from a specimen from Holzmadden. So that slightly stole our thunder a little bit. But we have uh, numerous other tissues as well preserved in the organics. So we have a layer here of uh, abundant melanosomes, which was present underneath the epidermal layer, but above the fibers. And we've interpreted this as being most likely representing melanosomes that have been uh, dispersed out of the melanophores, the chromatophores of the dermis. We tested the length, width, and aspect ratio of the melanosomes from these two different tissues, and they were significantly different from one another, with the melanocytes having sig significantly smaller melanosomes. And this is actually a condition that you see in living reptiles. We also found organics in the rib cage, underneath the ribs in a couple of specimens. And again, these had melanosomes preserved, which had a significantly different morphology to those of the integument. So we've interpreted these as most likely coming from the internal organs. Here are just a few more uh, SEM images of the putative melanocytes. And they're a little bit tricky to make out from there, so some handy outlines to show the rough shape of them. And from all of this information, we've produced this schematic of what we think is actually present in these ichthyosaurs. So we have at the top a phosphatized epidermal layer with in situ melanocytes sitting on top of a layer of melanosomes dispersed out of the dermal chromatophores. And these two sit on top of an unknown number of layers of fiber impressions from the dermis and then a phosphatized hypodermis. And when you look in the rib cage, this all sits on top of internal organs represented by melanosomes. So we looked at the distribution of the organic tissues in the integument with an eye towards paleo colour, so if we could try to figure out what colour these animals might have been in life. And we found that both the melanocytes and the dermal melanosomes were only found on either the dorsum of the animal or dorsal wood on the flank. Any of the soft tissues that came from the ventrum were just phosphatized. So this suggests that at least the specimens that we could uh, sample and get up close with had a countershading pattern, which is a dark back and a light belly. And this is one of the most common, if not the most common color pattern seen in large marine animals today. Again, this was a novel, uh, a novel interpretation until that paper came out and said the same thing as their specimen. One thing that we uh, did find that was quite surprising was organics preserved within the eye. So several of the specimens had dark patches within the sclerotic ring. And when we put these under the SEM, again, we found abundant melanosomes. This time, there appeared to be three different tissues compressed down on top of one another. So we have a layer of spherical melanosomes here, sitting on top of the layer of rod-shaped melanosomes. Both of these sat on top of a much thicker layer, again, of spherical melanosomes. And once again, statistically, uh, these were significantly all different in morphology to one another. 
Unfortunately, literature is fairly scant on melanosome morphology in uh, modern vertebrate eyes, but from the data we could find, we found, uh, or we came up with a hypothesis, that this top layer actually might represent the iris, because in living vertebrates, this has spherical melanosomes. And then underneath this, the retinal, or the retinal pigment epithelium, has both rod-shaped and spherical melanosomes in some living vertebrates. And the choroid, again, at the bottom, has spherical melanosomes again. And from this, we've produced a schematic of what an ichthyosaur eye may have looked like. And when we compare it here to a TEM image of a larval anchovy retina, you can see you have well, you can see you have rod-shaped melanosomes that protrude up between the rods and cones, and then a layer of spherical melanosomes sitting underneath. And again, this is the condition we find in the fossil. But as I mentioned, literature is fairly scant on this, so if anyone's an expert on melanosomes in the vertebrate eye, I'd love to chat to them about it. So in conclusion, we investigated a number of exceptional ichthyosaur specimens from several UK localities uh, to look at the soft tissue preservation, and we found a complex art architecture of dermal fibres with a consistent morphology and mode of preservation throughout, most likely representing the dermis. Uh, we have a number of pigmented or organic tissues deriving from different original tissues, including those of the eye. And at least in the specimens we could see, countershading seems to be a common color pattern in these Jurassic ichthyosaurs. So all in all, it's, it highlights how both the retention of melanin and the phosphatization of specific features can reveal uh, a high level of detail about the soft tissue anatomy of these iconic marine reptiles. I'd just like to thank a few people and thank you everyone for coming down and listening and I'm happy to take any questions.